All right, welcome back to another edition of Yes, We're Here. And this is a big thrill. We don't get our basketball fix from the NBA, but we're getting it from The Last Dance. And the director, Jason Hare, is with us today. But let's forget about basketball for just a minute and the Chicago Bulls and The Last Dance. Talk about the evil empire up there in Boston. You're a Red Sox fan. What is going on with your baseball team? We're the evil empire? Yes. <laughs> we're, we're the You've force. won all the time. We're, That's evil. We're the light side. No, no, no. We, we, we've become that. Um, I realized I'm, I'm a very self-aware Red Sox fan, so all Yankees fans, please don't hate me. Uh, I don't know what's going on, man. It's um, from where we were a couple of years ago to where it is now, it just seems to be kind of a mess. Uh, and, and you know what? I hate to, to be just like the cynical, defeatist Boston fan. It will never be as fun as it was uh, in those 03, 04, at the height, height, height of that, that Yankees rivalry. I remember going to, in 04, the opening weekend game, I think it was opening night of the season, Friday night, Fox put the game on national TV, and they don't normally start broadcasting those games until later on in the summer. But it was such a big deal that that Friday night game at Fenway, um, I was at that game, and, and they screwed our tickets up, and they somehow, it's a long story, but they somehow put us in the owner's box. Nice. Sitting in the owner's box. My dad, my, my brother Paul, and our friend Billy McMurtry were, were sitting in the owner's box next to Louis Tion, and it was so cold out that no one would sit outside. So all these owners, like 80, 90-year-old owners, are huddled up inside, and they were just serving us salmon and steak and free drinks. We wanted the game to go into extra innings. We were having such a great time. So I, I don't know when it will hit those heights yeah. of those playoffs, you know, rushing home to be with friends and watch that every single night. It was incredible. Now, I was at that game, 70 Yankee Stadium. I could still see the Johnny Damon home run leaving. I still say a great part of the rivalry was the Red Sox finally win. Next year on opening day, when they introduce Mariano Rivera at mm -hmm. Fenway, the crowd gives him the ovation, and Mariano being classy yeah. – Goes along with it, has a big smile and kind of tips his cap. That was pretty it reminded, cool. It reminded me of when two really great boxers who have talked so much smack to each other in the lead up to a fight have an incredible historic fight and then they hug each other afterwards. That's the kind of respect that it's always kind of tongue in cheek. There's jerk fans everywhere. And I think yep. that, you know, the worst of the Boston fans might be worse than the worst of the Yankee fans. Um, but there's so much respect there. Uh, I know mutually from our side for the Yankees and for, for Jeter and for the guys that, that, that are pillars of the Yankees dynasty, the, the, we have the respect for them. It might come out in a little bit of a different way, but it's all in good fun. All right. You're becoming a big star now, Jason. The last dance has been a huge hit. Everyone's watching it all over the country. We're happy with it. I'm going to assume for a minute that you're happy with it, but let's get to the nuts and bolts. Is Michael Jordan thus far happy with the product? I encourage you to ask him. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're still not done with it, it is the crazy part because we're still finalizing episode 10. We just finished episode nine less than a week ago um, with all the, the pandemic madness and, and the technological workflow uh, obstacles we had to overcome in the last six to eight weeks. Um, everything's been slowed, you know, grind, ground almost to a halt. So we're still finishing it up. Um, so it's interesting to kind of, peek our head out and, and see what the what the world is is saying about it, or at least the viewing sports viewing public is saying about it so it's been really gratifying because we've, we've worked really hard to to move up the date obviously and um it's just been great to see people are enjoying it just to i think it's kind of a fun nostalgic uh escape for people it seems to be like just the right thing at just the right time i'm doing i do an nba radio show on Sirius and one of the big topics of conversation has been everything with the dream team and Isaiah Thomas and walking off the court has that kind of been the one thing that stuck out in terms for you just in terms of how much attention kind of that relationship Isaiah Thomas Michael Jordan dream team Bulls Pistons how much that's been getting over the past couple of weeks uh, I've certainly seen his name more in in social media and as Isaiah has spoken about it um uh, I, I think it's probably eye-opening to younger fans and even younger players just how intense those rivalries were. I mean, Michael said to this day, I said, how authentic was that hatred for the Pistons? And he said, oh, I hated them. And that hate carries to this day. He doesn't mince words, and none of these guys do. Um, you know, I, Isaiah has his version of the events, and, and I think that he articulates himself really well. Um, and he's gotten a chance to, to explain his side of the story even further uh, in, in the media these days. It's just incredible, you know, how visceral 
though and, yeah. and, and, and intense those rivalries were that you can still be talking about it 20, 30 years later and it still garners eyeballs. Yeah, you know, I, I've texted him a couple of times, and last week I said, what are you apologizing for? I mean, that was the image that you guys wanted in Detroit. You embraced the idea of being the bad boys. You know, the one thing about them walking off the court there, and I think, you know, I thought you guys did a really good job telling the story. So for people who are talking about, well, is it going to be fair? Is it going to be too much slanted towards Michael Jordan? I think that you guys did a fair job at that because, number one, you showed the Celtics. Then you had the Pistons, but more importantly, you gave Isaiah Thomas a chance to explain it. How important was that for you, a documentary about the Bulls, to make sure that both sides were told? Paramount concern. Um, it would be tough to turn down access to Michael Jordan, especially coming from the era that I came from. I, I was eight years old when he was a rookie, so he's kind of the holy grail of, of stories you would want to tell of that era in sports. But if there were certain uh, restrictions that were made and we weren't allowed to pursue storylines or pursue interviewing characters, then I would have had to say no. And we always yeah. had, we always had permission and carte blanche and we were encouraged to tell every side of the story because Michael and, and his closest advisors, I think are smart enough to know that viewers are savvy and they'll see right through something that's going to be thoroughly one-sided. So of course he's going to be the hero in a lot of these stories because the things he did on the basketball court in a sports sense, I think heroic is, is, is bandied about a little bit too often these days, but he's going to be the victor in a lot of these stories because he won. But I think you'll see as the series goes on and especially next week, we're really confronting the stuff that I wanted to confront to, 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 to satisfy that need to, to be a responsible, comprehensive telling of the story. So it's Michael's perspective, but you're also getting the perspective of the teammates that he played with that he was really tough on. You're getting the perspective of the Isaiahs and the Gary Paytons and the Reggie Millers and the guys who he was you know, keeping from that, that uh, mountaintop. It's still painful for these guys. Yeah, It took us a while to get Reggie Miller, and, and uh, you'd be hard-pressed to convince me that part of it wasn't that he still – it still stings to talk about. He knows what we want to talk about. Um, so it, it, yeah. it takes, I give them credit because it takes a lot of guts and it takes a lot of trust that they put in us that we're going to tell this story responsibly. So uh, that's why I'm even over defensive of Isaiah and people like that in these stories, because I, I do make an effort to, to give their side of it as much as we can. Believe me, as a Celtics fan, A, it hurt me to, <laughs> to even have to show that the Celtics handled it the way that they did in Detroit. And B, I never knew that. So when you're, researching something for two years and, and reading tens of thousands of pages and, and books after books and watching all the films and trying to uncover every stone or un unturn every stone. When you hear something new in an interview, that's, you know, that that is going to be something that resonates with people because I feel like I've heard just about every story that's been written or read every story that's been written. So I didn't know that. Um, the circumstances are different because little, yeah, they were well, worried about time. court storming. In, yes, in, at the exactly. Silverdome, and they're the, and they're the visiting team. Yes. Detroit is the home team there, yes. and they're walking exactly. off the court. So th there exactly. is a bit of a difference that the Pistons kind of d don't really acknowledge. Let me ask you this about, and we're talking, of course, with Jason Harris, who's the outstanding director of The Last Dance, um, the whole stuff with the Dream Team. You have Michael coming out, and he really doesn't want to be responsible for Isaiah not being on the team. Then you have Magic recently came out and said, no, I had nothing to do with it. What's going to happen? Is it Justin Timberlake's fault? Is it Christian Leitner's fault that Isaiah wasn't on the Dream Team? How fascinated were you by that whole story of the Dream Team? Not only Isaiah, but also the Tony Kukoc element, which I thought you guys did an unbelievable job on. How fascinating was the whole Dream Team stuff for you? It was extremely fascinating to me. I, I, I went into it, though, I knew a lot about that. I had read the Jack McCallum book. I had yeah. seen the NBA Entertainment uh, documentary, which was fat, which was fantastic. Um, so I was fearing that this was going to be material that people were really used to and kind of bored with by then. Um, so then we had people. This is why it was really valuable to have all the partners that we had, because some, I'm sure the NBA probably thought, yeah, we've told that story before. The Netflix people came in and said, A, we've never seen this stuff, and B, the people around the world don't know anything about this. So maybe the Monte Carlo practice was featured Great. in NBA's documentary, but it had a limited audience. If it was showing on NBA TV or, or wherever they showed it, um, this was an opportunity to, to, to recycle that stuff and delve into it a bit deeper and, and have access to these guys again and to ask them about it again. The Kukoc stuff I found fascinating. I could have done two hours on Tony Kukoc. He's because of the reputation he had when he came into the league as being quote unquote soft. Ridiculous. And it took him, he had language barriers. He was a very young kid himself. He his family was in, in great danger back home. He had yep. 
kids and he had parents and brothers and sisters there. And I asked him about that reputation of being soft. And he said, soft. I had shells being dropped on my house when I was a kid. He was pulled out of his home when he was 14 or 15 and put in a dorm room to shovel snow and play basketball all day. That was, that was all that they let those kids do when they were identified as being potential Olympians to represent Croatia. So he is, he is uh, one of the most mislabeled athletes I've come across in terms of his softness um, being part of his, part of his narrative because he's yeah. the opposite. Yeah, I thought I thought it was really unfair. My thing was, okay, what if they traded places? If Scotty Pippen had to play for Croatia and then Tony Kukoc is playing for the dream team, you know, the results might have been a little bit different. But of course, a lot of that centers around Jerry Krause. And Jerry Krause now isn't around to defend himself. Once again, I think you guys do a fair job getting sound from Jerry Krause and having him try to explain himself, you know, after the fact. But when people talk about Michael Jordan, I think the one thing that you guys have done, which is very fair, he, there are certain cases where he comes across as a bully. Now, Kraus gets a little blame here. Why are you coming out and saying, Phil Jackson, this will be your last, your last year? And any chance he gets, he kind of pokes uh, Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan through the media. What about telling the story about Jerry Kraus, uh, you know, a gentleman who's no longer with us? It was important to me to get as much sound as we could from Jerry in the dock and to have him be as, as, as vibrant a figure as possible. Um, you know, he's no longer with us. And, and, you know, maybe we should have made it clear at the beginning of the documentary that Jerry is not alive. And that's the reason why we didn't do an interview. I, I, I felt that that would become evident uh, as, this, as the series progressed. Um, you know, I, I think David Halberstam said it best. He, he said, I forget what the exact quote is, but, but it was that uh, Jerry deserved more credit than he got, but he thought he deserved more than he actually did. So yeah. it was, he was stuck in the middle and he couldn't get, you know, part of it is, is you know, Michael ribbing him and saying, you know, those are pills that you take to keep you short and all that. Th those are, that's almost a camaraderie element yeah. in locker rooms. If you're not getting those kind of jokes, if you're not being referred to, it would be more disrespectful for Michael to just not even respond to Jerry and look straight past him rather than to rib him. A lot of the times that's how Michael shows affection and friendship. I'm not saying that he and Jerry were the best of friends. You can see what he said about him all the way up until his, his Hall of Fame speech. But I think that um, the ice has thawed a bit with all of these guys with Jerry's passing. And I think that, that the farther away they get from, from that time, the more they appreciate the vital role that Jerry played in building those teams. The only piece that was in place when Jerry came in to, to be GM was Michael Jordan. And it's, a, it's an enormous piece. Maybe it's yeah. the biggest piece in the history of, of the NBA puzzle. But he had the foresight to know that Tex Winter was an offensive genius and that he wanted to install the triangle. He had the foresight to see something in Phil Jackson that nobody else saw. Phil got laughed out of many uh, NBA offices when he tried to interview to be a coach. Um, he made gutsy trades. He traded Charles Oakley, Michael's best friend, for Bill Cartwright. Yeah. He saw something in Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant that few people saw. He got John Paxson. He got Steve Kerr. He got all of these little pieces that made those championship teams what they were. So I hope that by the end of this, People appreciate the role that he played. And I can guarantee you by the end of this, you'll see some unlikely voices offering, offering him superlative praise. All right, Jason, how many sit-down interviews did you do with Michael Jordan? And how much footage do you have of just those interviews that you did with him? We did three interviews with him, and we have eight hours of uh, wow. interviews with Michael. So how, how do you go through all that? Uh, with joy. It was incredible <laughs> to, to sit there and to listen back to. It. I remember the first one we did, and obviously you, you plan extensively for these things because you have a limited amount of time, especially with a guy like Michael, who was only contracted to do two interviews and ended up giving us three because we just had so much that we needed to get to. But after the first one, which was in June of 2018, uh, my brother, we did it down in Florida. My brother lives down there in Florida. I golfed with him the next day, and then I, I flew up to Boston to see my family. Um, for the weekend, just to take a, a few days. I think it was over 4th of July weekend was, was after that. And I had just gotten back the transcript and the MP3 of the interview. And my dad picked me up at the airport and we listened to the audio of the interview on the way home. And it was That's still awesome. to me, like I couldn't believe that that, that had happened. I felt like I was 10 years old. Um, and I'm certainly not jaded by that at this point, but luckily it became more and more routine to, 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 to go and interview him and, and to get the stuff that we needed. And also in the moment, you know this for, for what you do, you have to lock in. There's no time to think of anything else. Of, 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 there's very few moments to have this out of body experience. 
picture of Michael on my wall as a kid because you have a job to do in that moment. You have to lock in because if you don't do a good job with an interview with Michael Jordan, he could come in in a bad mood. The, the huge mansion that we interviewed him in, there could have been a huge thunderstorm and there could have been rain thrashing against those windows, which would have ruined the audio and ruined the look. There's so many things that had to line up. So the universe just smiled on us for, for eight hours out of the two years that we're making this thing. And um, I think that that's the difference maker in the quality of the doc. All right, Jason, what about Michael Jordan here? In ter- were there any questions that you asked him where he said, hang on a second, turn off the uh, cameras. I'm not answering that. Did you get any kind of blowback from Michael Jordan? Was, every, was there any topic that he wasn't going to discuss? Zero. Um, and my first meeting with him ever was, was eight or nine months before we actually rolled cameras. It was in September of 2017, and we didn't interview him with cameras until June of 2018. And during that interview, I said that there's, there's going to be some places that we're going to have to go that may be difficult. There's questions I have to ask you that are going maybe difficult to hear. I have to ask them, but you can choose how you want to answer them, but I have to ask them in order to be responsible in, in what I do. And he told me then, you can ask me anything you want. I'll be truthful. And I think, and I know that that, that continued. The second interview we did, the one where he's in the maroon shirt, I had emailed, um, not specific questions, just topics. Because these, a lot of this stuff happened 20, 30 exactly. years ago. So I was trying to remind him, you know, we're going to talk about when you guys beat the Suns in six or, or specific things like that, just to jog his memory statistically. And when he showed up on the set that day, he said, um, I saw your email. I didn't even read it. Uh, you can ask me anything you want. I'll be honest. I, I honestly think that he doesn't open himself up to sit down and do in-depth interviews like this that often. But I honestly think that he, he if you asked him a question, he would answer it. He was, you'll see in episode eight, um, his beef with, with SI about that Baggett Michael baseball cover was less that they put that unflattering picture of him on the cover and more that they didn't ask him about it. They didn't ask his side of the story. I think he's eager to talk about these things because in his mind, he doesn't regret anything and anything that is regrettable, it was a lesson learned. So he's eager to talk about that. He very much lives in the present, doesn't think too much about the past or the future. He lives right now. So when he's making these decisions, he's okay with those decisions. So when you ask him about stuff in the past, he'll give you an honest answer. I think he just hasn't been asked a lot of these questions, but it's not that he's been avoiding them. What about um, the soundtrack? That's been getting rave reviews. I mean, are you the guy that says we're going to play this song here or is your team, somebody on your team says, no, this soundtrack or this song would go good for this scene? I take it extremely seriously, the music with with any project that I do. It always starts with that. Uh, Whether we're going to use the music in the, the movie or not, Uh, I start out by just walking around my neighborhood, going to the gym, going on bike rides, whatever it is, listening to music that kind of will get me thinking about how the the movie is going to look and feel. And with this one specifically, we're talking about the 80s and 90s. Not only is that the sports culture that I grew up in, it's the music culture as well. And I was a massive hip hop fan from the time that I was seven or eight years old. That's when Run DMC and Curtis Blow and Nucleus and all these really early, you know, popular hip hop acts were coming out. Um, my brothers and I just ate that stuff up. So it was a field day, man, to, to, to go back and try to, to match music of the era. And we tried to be as era specific or year specific when we could as possible. So I would think back just because I listened to it so much, like, all right, in 1992, what would I have been listening to? Probably Black Sheep. And if 1992 was the year that they repeated, how about putting the choices yours underneath the shrug or underneath the highlight reel of, of 92? Rakim is, is I think, you know, top five rapper of all time. Certainly he's my favorite rapper of all time. And I think that he changed hip hop culture the way that Michael changed NBA culture. So I knew always that we wanted to use a Rakim song for Michael's rookie montage to try and match up those eras. So it's not that Michael was hip hop because I don't think he even listened to that a a lot, but I think the culture was, and it's just kind of a fun wink and a nod to people who appreciate that culture that we're trying to match these things up. So it's been probably the most gratifying part of the process for me is how people are responding to the music because I didn't expect that it would resonate with people the way that it has. Yeah, one final one before we let you go. You're a Boston guy. You grew up right in the shadow of Boston College. You attended Williams, which we didn't know that Williams was such a big NBA place because Duncan Robinson, who's now with the Miami Heat, started at Williams, ended up transferring to Michigan, but is in the NBA. You did the last dance. But there's another famous Williams graduate. That, of course, George Steinbrenner. How much of a presence on the Williams campus is George Steinbrenner? I never saw him on campus. He was incredibly nice to the – I played baseball there, and he was incredibly nice to the baseball program. So we – 
you know, we're a tiny D3 school. It's, it's, it's a step up from a high school all-star game, right? But yeah. we, he gave us the usage. We, we played our home games. We had a two-week trip through Florida every year for spring training or um, spring break for us, but it was half our season. We had to play down there because of the weather. And he gave us the use of the Tampa facilities. So this is while the Yankees are in spring training. I mean, we had our guys taking batting practice next to Jeter. And this was in 96. Like Jeter was a young kid just coming up. Um, all the Yankees were there using all the same facilities, all the bullpens in that. They had, there's a huge complex in Tampa. He let us play our home games there. So these teams and the teams who were playing us were thrilled about it too because they could come in and take BP next to these guys. He, we were staying in really bad motels. We had no money and, and it, we were funding our own trips. This is not like a big time program. When we got to Tampa, George Steinbrenner let us stay in his hotel. We were staying four guys to a room in these little motels. And then all of a sudden it was two guys to a room in the Hilton or the Hyatt or whatever he owns down there. He let us come to the complex. He gave us a tour. He told us to go into the, the uh, gift shop and take whatever we wanted. He could not have been a nicer guy. So I know that he's vilified in Boston and I grew up thinking of him as this villain figure down in New York, but I will forever have a completely different view of George Steinbrenner after my experience with him. There it is. Jason Harry admitted he is a closet Yankee fan. It was good to end the interview <laughs> on that. Jason, we really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Congratulations. The project is incredible. Everyone is enjoying it. And we'll catch up with you soon, okay? Thanks so much. All right, that's going to do it for Yes, We're Here. We'll see you again.